Welcome to the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. Today is Saturday, July 7th, 2014, and we are live worldwide. Also airing in syndication on iTunes, Around the Cabin, and Freedomizer Radio. On today's episode, we discuss a high-angle rescue in DeCue Falls, take a look back at the beginning of the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show, and share our thoughts on a variety of topics with you, our listener. And now here's your host... The Wolfman. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, thanks for joining us. And let's not forget to say hello to our producer. AD Venture. Hi, everyone. Great to be here today. Remember, you can always contact us directly at our toll-free number, 1-866-248-1362, extension 300. So let's get this show started. It's been absolutely amazing, this path that we've been on with the Barefoot Bushcraft radio show. Some of our listeners may remember that we actually started this show April 20th, 2013. So we're over a year old, and we've seen quite a few changes. What do you think of what we've experienced so far, Wolfman? It's been a fun show. Uh, You know, when I listened to our first episode, you can literally hear us fumbling in the background you know we weren't although i'm an experienced um you know personality and and, an outdoor person and you know we we, with students an awful lot um listen listen to the opening of our first show now we're just going to play this little clip here and you can literally hear me fumbling until we get you on the on the show hello and welcome to the barefoot bushcraft radio show I'm the Wolfman, and today is April 20th, 2013, and this is our very first show. So I'm waiting for my co-host, uh, A.D. Venture, should come on into the show, and we will get started. Oh, hold on just one second. Oh, my apologies there. Oh. So I have a caller here coming in, and I'm going to bring you on. Hello, caller. Welcome to Barefoot Bushcraft. Hi there, Wolf. This is A.D. Venture. Well, hello. I'm glad you could make it. Sorry about the technical issues. I'm finally connected. I don't know. What do you think about that, A.D.? Well, it definitely was a challenge to move on to a new system, I've had quite a lot of experience with audio recording and studio production, but the system that we initially started to use when we first came out with the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show was a little foreign to the both of us. So it did take a few episodes for us to finally get into our groove and get a lot more used to the system that we were utilizing. But as you'll notice, at least five, six episodes in, you really start to hear that change and things get a lot more tight, and they sound a lot more enjoyable, and they become a lot more enjoyable for us to do. I agree 100%. Uh, You know, the radio show is something that, um, you know, we really love and are very, very passionate about doing. Uh, For the most part, you know, it's not something that, I don't know, it doesn't make us a whole lot of money in the respect that, you know, nobody pays to be on the show. In fact, uh, you know, all of the guests that come on, um, come on to the show volunteer. And we've had some really great guests. Um, You know, we've had some guests from around the world, from places as far away as, you know, to be clear, we're in the Ontario, Canada area. But we've had guests from Australia. We've had guests as far away as Norway. We've had traveling guests that have been, you know, calling us from a mobile location. We've had guests who have been indicted into the Explorers Club, including the chairman of the uh, Canadian uh, Geographic Society. You know, we've tried our best for the people who were involved in the outdoor education, preppers, bushcraft survival network, to try to get some people who are really fascinating and interesting to talk to. You know, it's very difficult for me to narrow down my favorite guests because they are all phenomenal in their own ways. I would love to hear from you, A.D., about some of of your commentary on some of our guests, um, the ones that you've enjoyed the most, I guess. 
That's like trying to ask what your favorite knife is or your favorite child. It's a little difficult because like you've mentioned, Wolfman, there's been so many different amazing guests on our show, and they've literally been from around the world, whether it's been deep in the south of the United States, somewhere in the outback of Australia, in the northern reaches of Norway, all over the planet. And it's just absolutely incredible to connect with all these different individuals and get their different perspective on the world as it is and the outdoor lifestyle. But regarding specific guests that I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed having Peter Jenkins on the show. Not only did he walk across America, but he wrote a book with that exact same title. It was very enjoyable to have him on the show. But he's one of the many, many different guests that we had that I really enjoyed. There was also Lynn Albert, who crossed Wales entirely in her bare feet. We had Gino Ferry of Survival in the Bush, Inc. It's just so many guests that we could discuss. It would be just one episode discussing all the different guests that we had and how much enjoyment we've had. How about yourself, Wolfman? Did you find any particular guest that you liked more over others? Well, you know, you're, you're correct, uh, A.D. I, it, we've had so many incredible guests on the show. It's, it's really hard to pick a favorite. Um, I suppose the ones that, um, that I love speaking to the most are ones that in a, previous in, you know, in a previous way I have admired their work. So I would have to say people like Jill Heinrich. Canada's top scuba diver. You know, I was very honored to have her on the show. Um, people like, um, you know, I'm just trying to think like Mark Mori, you know, and I will shamelessly say that, you know, I'm a Mark Mori groupie. I really admire his work and, and, and what he does and, and who he is. Uh, there's been so many great people and, and, and even uh, people like David Arama, who, who runs, uh, you know, a successful uh, the, the Wilderness Survival School. You know, and I've had the chance to work with Mr. Arama on multiple occasions uh, in different aspects, incredible person. Um, and, and, you know, when, when, what some people don't realize is although for, a, I would say about 20% of our guests, we have a personal relationship with them. Most of our guests we've never met before, or we've only seen them on, you know, seen them on the, on the internet or whatever. Um, and, and it's, it's kind of fascinating to get them in, um, and just, just to, to see them in a different light. And, and it's not always, you know, it's not always in their, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this, to see them in a light where they can be themselves and just relax a little bit, you know. Um, one of the, my favorite, favorite episodes of the Barefoot Bushcraft radio show was when we had Kevin Callan on. And it was like, we tried so hard to stay to our questions, right? We've had Kevin on the show more than once. But this last time that he was on, we tried to keep on our questions. And he just like, with his humor, he totally threw away our entire script and we were all giggling and laughing and it was literally just like a bunch of guys around the fire. Do you, do you remember that AD? I very much do remember that episode and that was a great one. As you mentioned, Kevin Cowan has been on the show multiple times. He's a great person, very enjoyable to listen to a lot of great stories to tell and his humor definitely separates him from the rest of the crowd. And it really highlights a different way to reach an audience and it's so effective because he's constantly speaking throughout the entire province of Ontario, as well as going across the country of Canada and into the United States to do these special speaking engagements. Yeah, I agree that he was a spectacular guest, and we could have him on for literally hours because of all the stories that he could tell us. And on that note, we're going to talk about some of the changes that you are going to see in the Barefoot Bushcraft radio show in the future. So as uh, all of our listeners know who have, who have been with us since the beginning, and we have had a core group of listeners that we truly love and appreciate, and really the show wouldn't be what it is without your listenership. And that is very, very important to us. I, I cannot overstate how incredible that is um, that all of you were here listening to the show. Um, and, you know, one of the funny things is, you know, Barefoot Bushcraft is also an outdoor education center. It's a school. We teach lessons. Um, you know, sometimes we'll have people come over and they'll be like, hey, I listen to your radio show all the time. That's how I found out about, you know, the sandal making workshop or I found out about archery lessons. That's great. Uh, but as things have changed over time, again, the show has been on now. In, it's into its second year. You're seeing a lot of changes. Everything, like I said, from our very first kind of hokey, quirky episode that truly was the best we could do at the time, to a much more professional and finished, um, 
finished episode, we used to broadcast live. Um, and this is our very first episode that we have not broadcast live on Freedomizer Radio. So we are moving away from that live air, live to air broadcast, and we are going to a different kind of animal. Um, so AD, I would love because AD is our producer and does all the technical work, graphic design, and all that thankless behind the scenes stuff that's terribly, terribly important. I will give it to you, and you can sort of take it a little more. Like kick it up a notch. Tell us a little bit about more what our listeners are going to hear in the future. What can be expected for the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show is we will be featured on many more radio stations and websites than we currently are now. We are now featured on Around the Cabin, and we are in negotiation to get our show onto a few more. Right now, nothing has been finalized, so I can't really reveal where we will be appearing, but rest assured, there are many different organizations that have shown great interest in the Barefoot Bushcraft radio show, and we want to make sure that we can share this show with as many people as possible. And something else that our listeners are going to notice is an improved quality with the show. It'll sound a lot clearer, a lot nicer, and because we are moving to a post-produced show, it will allow us to ensure that that quality stays high. Unfortunately, due to the previous limitations of the system that we were using, there was that quality issue, but that's no longer the case. So you will now be hearing some very beautiful quality radio shows, and we truly think that you will enjoy them. For sure. And I mean, the audio quality was something that we did. We were a little bit concerned about. Um, the odd person had mentioned it to us that we sounded like a, a telephone quality broadcast, right? And we wanted to move away from that. Now, to be fair, there are many times that the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show is um, broadcast from remote locations. For example, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be broadcasting live from something called the Annual Preppers Event, which is going to be held in a nuclear bunker. It's going to be an amazing weekend. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our recording equipment. We're going to go on site to this event like we did with Headwaters and harvest gathering and do our recordings there. Um, so, you know, we don't, as part of our commitment to, to you, our listener, we're always thinking about, let's go, what if somebody can't make it to these events? What if I live in South Texas and I can't, make, I can't make the drawing for that two day event up in Ontario, Canada. That's totally reasonable. So we go there, we interview people. Um, and with that, you know, it's a change in equipment. Uh, so it's, it's, it's going to be some, some great growing things, uh, for sure. And you'll notice as well that as a reflection of that, oftentimes we'll change our logo a little tiny bit when you look at the episode itself, just to make it a little bit more interesting, just to sort of draw you in. You know, AD Venture and I, both uh, in another live, we were graphic designers, so we still bring that with us to the table, always making things look a little bit kind of interesting, kind of exciting, so you can sort of see and reflect the changes that we want to make to the show. And um, a lot of the changes that we make as well are simply from we, listeners like yourself, people will email us, give us a ring, and say, hey, you know what, I'd like, I noticed this, maybe this could be better. And we appreciate that feedback for multiple reasons. Um, the one thing I love about feedback is it tells me someone was listening to the show. And that's always, that's always a great thing. We love hearing from you. Please drop us an email, producer at barefootbushcraft.com. Uh, let us know what you think of the show, some show ideas, anything you've got. We're all, we, we'd love to have that. Um, that sort of that interaction with everybody. The thing that I am going to miss about having a live show is the tweeting and the and the emails and the Facebook messages and all that stuff that used to go on during the hour show. But I'm sure from a producer standpoint, AD, it's going to take the pressure off you of not having to deal with those immediately. Well, to be quite honest, there were a few limitations that prevented us from moving forward in the direction that we would have preferred to have been in. However, I want to remind all our audience that I am actually working towards a solution that will allow us to broadcast high-quality episodes remotely from all the different events that we will be attending and participating in. So currently, I'm just in the process of getting the technology together, putting together a plan, and getting ready for an eventual rollout of a broadcast system that will allow us to maintain the high quality of this show while we are out doing these special events, workshops, and courses. 
And as the Wolfman mentioned, there was that issue in the past where some of the quality of the shows were affected because we were broadcasting remotely. And that needs to be understood because some of the really remote areas that we go to have little or no telephone signal whatsoever. Sometimes we even have to go through satellite phones or some other method to ensure that this connection gets out. However, the plan that I have will allow us to do our broadcast in the most remote regions. That's something that I'm working hard towards and very much look forward to rolling out in the near future. And on that note, let's move into our first segment. In the News. Today on In the News, we're going to discuss a high-angle rescue at DeCute Falls in Ontario, Canada. Dated Thursday, July 3rd, 2014. Emergency services were called out to DeCute Falls around 1,600 hours to aid hikers that were trapped in the DeCute Falls Gorge. Members of the St. Catharines Fire Department high-angle rope rescue team were able to, hu- to haul all four hikers onto the trails of the escarpment when it became too slippery to navigate. Although ambulance services were on the scene, none of the hikers, which included two men and one woman, needed medical attention. So that's the article. It's really quick. Um, you know, we talk about a lot of weird stuff on the show, strange things. I really enjoy the comments um, about this about this radio show. But before we – we'll leave the comments – reader comments to the last so ad why don't you tell me your unplugged review of a bunch of guys going into a gorge and getting stuck now i do have to share with our audience here that even though these occurrences do happen from time to time in the outdoors and being in the outdoor industry we are well aware of that i'm getting real sick and tired of hearing of this shit to be quite honest the fact is these people should know what they're getting themselves into. I mean, the fact is, practically monthly, we are hearing about people in need of rescue in these regions. Recently, for example, there was another rescue required in the Niagara Gorge, and this all is in the same sort of vicinity and region. And it just... It gets tired from our position, from someone who works in the outdoor industry, to continually see these issues happen time and time again. And people don't seem to understand that with just a little bit of prevention, you can avoid these issues altogether. But it gets, it gets me personally frustrated to see that the, this happens Over and over again, nobody learns their lessons. It's not like the information is not available out there, not only to find out how to be safe, but that these issues are reoccurring in the same regions, and all people have to do is look at the details to say, maybe I shouldn't go down into that unmarked trail area because there might be a problem. But the fact is that these issues are always, always avoidable. They're unacceptable. And to be quite honest, it's bullshit. You know, I, I couldn't agree with you more, A.D. Um, for the most part, the Barefoot Bushcraft radio show has aired on various radio shows in the United States. So we've had to be a little careful about how we – and gentle – about how we speak of issues like this. But the reality is – and I've been to the DQ Falls hundreds of times, and that's not even exaggeration. Hundreds of times. All right, now what would be acceptable is a couple of guys were out there, and the guy was drunk – and he slipped over the edge, down he went, and he needs rescuing. I understand that. Number one, probably shouldn't be going out into the woods when you're drunk, but that kind of stuff happens on occasion. But the fact that you willfully left the trail that is marked and beaten down and flat, and you went into these areas that, you, that are obviously dangerous. If you look over the edge of a trail, and there's a big, huge like a 20 meter or 60 foot drop or whatever the equation is. And it's all stoned and it's, there's a river running down there. There's a good reason the trail doesn't go down there. Don't go down there. It's, and, and you're absolutely right, AD. If you're, if you're trained in high angle rescue, rappelling, climbing, military background, all the stuff like yourself and myself are, that is a totally different experience than going down there when you don't have a clue as to what you're doing and you have no equipment to, uh, to get yourself to get yourself lost and hurt. Um, 
You know, we've had this discussion many times on the show. If you go down there and this happens to you, there's no reason you shouldn't have to work out some kind of payment plan to pay off this if negligence was, was the issue. Now, the one thing I can tell you about this to Cube Falls area, if you kept, if this guy had kept walking, he would have walked right out of the gorge. It flattens out and ends up at a roadway, probably maybe 50, 60 um, I'm just, I'm just trying to think. It's yeah, maybe about a kilometer, so a couple hundred meters, um, you know, a thousand meters away from where he got stuck. He would have he would have literally walked into a road. So we had to send our emergency fire rescue people to go and risk their lives, set up all this stuff, block the area off, ambulances that now have to sit there in case these guys are injured, and for what? The guy had had a backpack and water and a compass and a topo mat. He'd have been all right. You know, I, it's very very frustrating. So let me give you a little bit of a background about myself. Now, every month, you know, uh, I'm out there in the wilderness. I'm teaching classes. I'm trained and certified in a, a huge load of stuff, right? Um, and not only did I take these courses, I practice it every day at work because that's what I do for a living. I still get emails from people who see my pictures, watch my videos, and the emails are almost always the same when they're negative. You're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. You're going to get someone killed. And my favorite... Put some shoes on before you break your feet, before you cut yourself. All right. I go down into the Niagara Gorge. I've gone down there for 20 years in my bare feet. You've never seen my name in the paper from getting needing to get rescued. So, you know, yet I'm sure this guy, I, I, these guys probably had shoes on when they went down there. So it, it's another one of those things. Like my training and education, I'm in a different level than 99% of the hikers out there, just like AD Venture is, just like – Really great outdoors people are like, um, you know, David Arama and Les Stroud and all those people, you know, Doug Getco. The, the list goes on and on and on. We know what we're doing. When you see us out there in our bare feet or, or doing something that you can't conceptualize, doesn't mean we don't know what we're doing. doesn't mean we're unsafe. It just means we're trained to do that. Um, you know, and, and these costs as well is something we want to talk about. Um, you know, this isn't cheap to get rescued. So let's, let's go on. Anyways, to some of the comments. So now you have a little bit of a background. Um, that I've been down there, like I say, hundreds of times in my bare feet, but I always go with equipment. So we have uh, a commenter by the name of Kelev, and he says, if they went down there before that storm hit, coming back out would have, may not have been difficult. Put some stairs in the area where we spend millions of dollars making ugly buildings, but we don't do enough to help people to beauty of nature. So I'm not going to comment too much on these because, of course, I've got my own opinions. Um, but there we go. Here's another guy. Mike Garrett says, build a stairway like they have at Niagara Glen. And this one um, by Doremi Fasola. I'd rather they fence it off. This is cheaper in the long run. Just let this particular area of the gorge get, go natural and don't disturb the natural flora and fauna that has existed. Some places like this need to be left by, to creatures not trampled on by humans. Go to the Niagara Gorge and stay on the trails. Anyways, that's very frustrating to me, but so be it. Um, you know, here's another one from Dave401. I've never gotten myself lost down there, but could just as well, they could put up a couple signs. So there's, you know, the public is, the public is looking at this, right? For, and then here's somebody, Fast and Furious, says, first off, going into any gorge, you're doing so at your own risk. Second, if you're going hiking, it would only make sense to bring the proper gear. Look at the big picture. I don't, I, you don't have no idea if these guys are wearing proper shoes and equipment. Start using common sense. And, and the comments go on and on and on. Um, you know, here, here's another one from Chris W. You can lead a human to education, but you cannot make him think. Why on earth would anyone go hiking in that kind of terrain and if there's possible of bad weather? These clowns are, should be charged for the rescue. It was their own fault for being stranded in a steep valley instead of, instead of walking out. Stupidity of some people never ceases to amaze me. So on that note, handing it over here to Mr. A.D. Venture talk a little bit more about some of these comments um, try to keep it real I'm disappointed but I'm not surprised by these comments the majority of them are basically people talking out of their asses it's unbelievable that that one individual said to fence off the entire gorge so if we continue on that line of thinking we might as well close down all parks we might as well rip up all green spaces and just create one entire land of concrete 
at least that's what it seems to be indicating to me. Let's think about maybe 20, 50, 100 years ago. People still like to go hiking. People still like to enjoy the outdoors. And yet there wasn't this idiocy to consider closing off green spaces because of injuries. One of those comments did mention that a little bit of planning would go a long way. If this individual perhaps was familiar with the area or had made themselves familiar with the area by utilizing something as simple as a map, they would have known exactly where to go or the vicinity and what they might have needed to do in case they couldn't get back the way they came. Additionally, there's something called the Internet and Google. That's existed for quite some time. There's absolutely no excuse whatsoever for someone to claim ignorance in a day like today when all the resources are out there for you to learn about this sort of thing. Speaking of which, if you were to go to Google, type in Niagara Gorge Rescue, and then click Search, you are going to see about 2 million pages that indicate a recording of such an event. And you can see this by date, for example, May 7th, 2014, Dramatic Rescue at Niagara Gorge. April 19th, 2014, Man Rescued from Niagara Gorge. July 24th, 2012, Teen Dies, Police Officer Injured After Following into Niagara Gorge. Now that police officer unfortunately lost their life trying to attempt a rescue of an individual that made an active choice. We have to remember that even though a lot of people don't want to accept personal responsibility, that does not exclude you from that responsibility. If you make a choice, that was your choice to make. You didn't have to make that choice. You chose to do so, and you have to live with those consequences. Unfortunately, time and time again we see this, and this has happened at the Niagara Gorge, an individual who was rescued attempted to sue the city and the rescuers for the calamity that he put himself in. Luckily, the courts didn't see it that way, struck down the lawsuit, and forced him to pay their legal bills. That I can agree with, because in my opinion, it is absolutely unacceptable to allow for these issues to continue to occur without the proper repercussions to those that bring about these follies. I know that my opinions might sound a little harsh, but after seeing these things years after years after years, knowing what I know, knowing what we try to teach others, knowing that these resources are out there and available for the whole public to learn, there really is no reason for these issues to continue to occur. And on that note, we're going to take a quick commercial break. This is AD Venture, joined by the Wolfman, and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to the second half of the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. This is A.D. Venture, joined by the Wolfman. And the Wolfman was just about to comment on my thoughts on society today and the total lack of a sense of personal responsibility. Now, I, I couldn't agree with you more, um, A.D., about this, that we have gone to a society of becoming risk-takers, like Sir Edmund Hillary, taking responsibility to try to offload that responsibility to other people. And I don't think it's fair if I fall into a gorge and I wreck my ankle and I have to be dragged out by a helicopter, that I have the right to go and sue the guys who helped me. I just, it's beyond, you know, it's beyond my comprehension, you know. Uh, it, and it's like one of those things, you know, I go down into the gorge and I would make videos and documentaries and all that stuff. And then I get these emails, oh, you're an idiot. You're going you're gonna to kill yourself. Well, you know what? I didn't end up in the newspaper from that. And, you know, if you go to other countries of the world, there are many countries where nobody even cares about that stuff. And there is personal responsibility. You know, you watch things like these ice road trucker guys and they go out into these very remote areas into India and all sorts of stuff. And you see just how bad the world, you know, some of the areas where they go to is with vehicles and they're driving around on these narrow roads. You take that responsibility when you go out on the road, there's, there's nothing we can do to, to stop that or to, or to fix that. The world is a dangerous place, um, and it's, you have to accept that. There's no way around that. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know. 
Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very challenging to me to hear stories like this. And uh, I just, it's very, very difficult. I don't know. I'm, I'll, I'll leave it over to you, A.D. I totally agree with you, and I can sense the frustration in your voice because I'm sure you can hear it in mine because I, I, I just really get bothered by the fact that these issues exist. And as we have explained with our listeners here on the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show, in our profession, our number one priority is your safety. That's the bottom line. One of my philosophies is I will never allow anyone to get hurt or injured under my watch, and I will do everything possible to ensure that's the case. Unfortunately, sometimes that leads to people being a little upset that I'm trying to ensure that they're safe, but I don't want that on my conscience, knowing that I could have done something to prevent a death or injury, and I chose, there's the key word again, I chose not to do it. But I think that these issues are endemic, actually, to the extreme adventure culture and what comes out of them, which are referred to as keyboard commandos. And on that note, we're going to move into our next segment. Round table Review The Keyboard Commando, yes. The internet is filled with the Keyboard Commando from everyone who believes that they are some kind of communist and socialist because they read about it on the internet to people that believe they are the next Les Stroud because they read it on the internet. Uh, this is a phenomenon that is sweeping the world, getting people killed, um, both um, from just generally doing things that are completely inappropriate and wrong to getting people Filled with all, literally, it's a self brainwashing technique. So, um, you know, there, in our culture of outdoor education, survivalist prepper, there is a significant amount of conspiracy type theorists that just somehow end up there. Um, you know, you know, a lot of us work very hard to make sure that we don't have that stigma. Um, although sometimes it's hard not to get sucked into it. So I will, I will turn it over to AD Venture because I know uh, I would love to hear from you a little bit more about this. About the keyboard commando, I read it on the internet. Well, I've got to disagree a little bit with you. I don't see sort of a conspiracy-type theorist being equated with a keyboard commando. A keyboard commando, in my opinion, is more so someone that wrote some of those comments, for example, on that article about the rescue. Or people that will write an article with their thoughts, and they haven't done the research necessary into the background of a situation. And I actually see this more as a Western civilization problem than something that happens with Eastern cultures. Because it seems to be that our Western society is lacking something, and you can see that from people's actions, you have a lot of individuals taking up these extreme sports, or extreme adventures, or extreme lifestyle. So, for example, they might go ahead and decide to climb Mount Everest without ever having taken any training, and they die. Or they get very injured and they have to be rescued, and then in turn they want to try to sue their Sherpas or try to get some sort of settlement out of the government. And unfortunately, you see this all over the world in all these different situations, all these different locations, And it seems to be a very Western-based issue. It seems to be that for some reason, we are lacking something in our lives, in our spirits, that forces a lot of people to go to an extreme to feel that satisfaction. You can actually equate it to someone who has a drug addiction or any other addiction. They're not getting that satisfaction inside them, and they have to keep increasing that dosage whether it be in drugs or adventure, to try to reach that point of satisfaction. But the secret is you'll never reach that point of satisfaction if that's your mentality. If you're not happy with what you have, then you'll continually look for something that's not there. And that, in my opinion, is why a lot of these deaths, unnecessary deaths, occur when people are climbing mountains, for example, or scuba diving, or going out for some ice fishing, 
there's always that desire to increase risk, but it's not a, a necessary risk. It's just increased risk just to do so. And that, in turn, leads to all these issues that we see. Dissatisfaction with activities, dissatisfaction with life, a desire to continue to increase the risk that they're being exposed to, but with no gain or benefit out of it. And it, I find it quite sad and quite telling of a society when people aren't satisfied with just sitting in nature, for example. Take five minutes to sit down and just take in the forest. Nope, that's too much. That's boring. That's, you know, we should be doing something. We should be running. We should be mountain biking. We should be skydiving. It has to be extreme. And, and that, I think, is the crux of the problem. Well, it's funny you should mention that. In 2008, on June 25th, I published an article on my website, wolfman.com, and I will read you the article. Brain region for adventureness has been found. June 25th, 2008, courtesy of the Wellcome Trust and World Science staff. Scientists have identified a brain region which they say encourages us to seek adventure. Located in a very primitive part of the brain, it's activated when we choose unfamiliar options, the researchers said. This suggests that trying, trying out the unknown offered advantages to our evolutionary ancestors. This may also explain, they went on, why the rebranding of familiar products encourages them to choose them again and again off supermarket shelves. Researchers have shown that volunteers um, had a selection of cards, each with an image the volunteers had already seen. Each image was associated with the chance of a reward. Participants were allowed to choose some of the images that they had hoped um, that would have prizes. As the game went on, the players could also figure out which choice would provide the highest rewards. When unfamiliar images were introduced, the researchers found volunteers were more likely to take a chance and pick one of these rather than go with a safer option. So you can read the article on the, on the website. We'll throw it up on our Twitter um, so you can have a look at it. They have said in many areas that the sections of the brain – that shoot, that you want adventure, they, it's like basically like being an adrenaline junkie. Your adrenal or your excitement glands really get they get stretched, right? It's like uh, when people report that they have drug addictions, they need more and more drugs to get that fixed. Um, and you know, I think it's the same thing, same thing with this adventure. However, my contention to this, and I would love AD to speak about this, is that we live sedate lifestyles. We we truly are the keyboard commandos. I know it because I read it on the internet, and I'll spend the next half an hour explaining how you're wrong and I'm right because it's something I read on the online. While that may be fun and exciting and frustrating to those around us who really don't care about that stuff, um, the reality is our sedate lifestyles, our gaming that people do, the gaming, gaming for, for humans has been developed because kids can't go outside, get hurt, go play, skin knees, climb trees, break bones. No, 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 stay inside and be safe because outside is scary. So we try to fill that need of excitement by playing these games. And I believe it's the same in the adventure world. You get such a rush and such a high for those who have broken that shell of living indoors to going outside and, and, and tapping into that primal play part of your body that you go outside and it's so awesome that you have to keep going and keep going. And you get that, no matter, that pushing yourself, um, even blindly, it, it, and, and we get that, and you see that in all areas of life. Even for people uh, like myself in the barefoot community, we'll go further and further and further, push their limits a little harder. People in the adventure community, the same thing. Where I have a problem, and I'm, I'm sure AD will speak to this, is where you do it, and you don't have a flipping clue what you're doing. I have had many students say, well, you go without your shoes all the time, I'm going to take my shoes and socks off, and can't figure out why they're sore. This is the exact same as going and trying to climb Mount Everest when you've never even worn a climbing helmet and don't even know what an eight is in a climbing sense. So it's super important that if you're going to do this, that's great. It's what the human experience is about. You're never going to remember that day in the office, but you will remember the time you tried to climb Mount Everest as long as you survive. Over to you, A.D., now, I partly agree that the sedate lifestyle adds to this problem. However, I truly believe that there's a total lack of emphasis on the importance 
of not only physical activity, but of nature exposure. The term nature deficit disorder is really only a recent term. However, we've been seeing the symptoms of it for at least the last 30 years in the population, if not more. And that is basically because there is no emphasis on the importance of nature exposure. And you see a lot of that with inner city schools and even schools in, in suburban areas that no longer have playgrounds, refuse to allow the kids to play tag. Some of it has to do with this misconception, mostly from parents or school bureaucrats that don't wish to be sued, but don't want to have that risk of activity going on. However, it needs to be clearly understood that most of society does not understand risk, period, because these are the results that we're seeing with the kids, the obesity epidemic, the total disconnect with nature to dictate that a gorge be closed down because someone got hurt. Let me just uh, pause there for a moment to gain my composure again. As you can tell, this is a topic that I feel very strongly about and see the solution being so simplistic that it just boggles my mind that we continually have to hear from individuals, these keyboard commandos, who think that because they read it on the internet that it has to be correct. And yet, as the Wolfman mentioned, these people go out to experience this extreme culture but don't take the necessary precautions or even the planning necessary to prepare themselves to do that activity. And it is just very frustrating from a nature interpreter and from an outdoor educator's point of view to see these issues and to know that a solution is very simple but not have anyone move in the direction necessary to get that done. And I think there's something as well, A.D., that I'm just as passionate about. Um, you know... The, 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 what do you think of the correlation between video games and being stuck inside? Can you speak to that a little bit? I'd say 100%. Back in our day, we had things such as the Atari 2600, or VCS, as it was called before. Oh, yeah. The Nintendo Entertainment System, or the Sega Master System, and those were limited with their graphics and such. But more importantly, what was different back then at least a, a lot more than it was today, is the emphasis of parents to get their children out and enjoy the outdoors. I remember when I was a child that we were expected to basically be outside of the house most of the weekend because my parents didn't want us staying inside watching TV or playing video games. We had to earn that right. But nowadays, with this entitled attitude that not only children have, but that parents have, and I'm sorry to broad stroke everybody here, but it, it's so overwhelming to see all this in the society that we're surrounded by that it's just really difficult to, to find a method to, to make people understand that it's just a matter of values and to shift those values to what's more important. And that will in turn start to make you healthier, start to get you more active, clear up your mind, because it's been proven that there are links towards increased aggression through the use of playing video games. Now, video games aren't a bad thing by themselves, but if a parent does not enact discipline on a child to ensure that they've earned that right to play, that they, they're not stuck in the room all day on the computer, and that they have to go out and at least participate in some physical activity, then the parent is just, to, just as much to blame as the child and society. Now, granted, some people might say, well, how can you blame the child? They don't know any better. But, again, in this day and age, children are exposed to a lot more information than in my day or in Wolfman's day. So there really is that no excuse for someone to, to not know. And when you get obese to the point where even walking up the stairs causes you to breathe heavily that should be a personal indication that there's an issue there, a physical issue. And that in turn should, should force some sort of reaction to that. 
However, as we see in, in society, that isn't the case. I'm, I'm speaking idealistically, and what we see in, in reality is, is quite contrasting. You know, we talk about this literally, um, to, lose, to use a really easy term, ad nauseum on the show, of getting outside. You know, there's many times that uh, AD Venture and I have broadcast this show sitting on a park bench or sitting in a, you know, sitting in the woods. Uh, it's so important to have that connection, you know, and to get out there and to get the training and to get the experience. And I think I've said this multiple times on the show that 50 years ago, so five decades ago, uh, jobs like AD Venture and I have, that our job is to teach people wilderness skills would not have existed in North America anyways. There would have been no outdoor educators. It wasn't a thing. It would have been about as valid of a job as um, being a computer web designer in 1925. It just didn't exist. And the reason is, is because people grew up outside. You grew up learning these skills. If you wanted to hike or to camp, that was something that you, that was, that was sort of the way you were. And, um, you know, we, we, from the move of society from, from cities to, um, you know, or I'm sorry, from the country to cities, we've seen this shift of people are basically, literally, we're losing our humanity by getting involved and staying inside all the time. Now, ironically, it's easy for people like um, Dr. Sheldon Cooper from Big Bang Theory to say, if outside is so great, why did we spend thousands of years perfecting inside? And I kind of chuckle at that because, you know, there are days when the weather is bad. I don't want to be outside. But... um there was an old television series called Earth 2 that aired in the, uh, in the 90s. And the people were getting sick on board this starship because they weren't on Earth. And that was, they, they were, they, it was like an Earth deficit disorder. And that's exactly what's happening out there. The problem is people play these video games like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Medal of Honor or any of those. And they think that they're a soldier. Playing a video game doesn't get you outside. It doesn't get you, you know, because you can pull a trigger on a video game. It means nothing. Uh, you know, a perfect example of that is I once had a young boy in tears at the archery range. Couldn't hit the target to save his life. That's okay. You know, archery is about the fun. It's not necessarily about the goal, right? And he said, I have three gold medals in wee archery. I don't understand why I can't shoot. And it was like I kind of kind of chuckle a little bit. But, uh, you know, the poor guy. And I could kind of feel to that. I don't know. What about you, A.D.? Again, I'm going to have to emphasize my thoughts on this by saying it's all about personal responsibility. If personal responsibility is taken up, we understand that sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. And it's our responsibility, if we want to get better at something, to practice, to try to improve ourselves. So I see that, again, with this keyboard commandos, with these extreme adventure cultures that exist, mostly a Western-based societies, it's a total lack of personal responsibility that gives them this entitled attitude that they should be able to climb this great large mountain, doesn't matter if they litter on their way there, because this is a, an accomplishment for them. It's, again, a, a total lack of personal responsibility that leads people to think that they don't need any training, that they don't need to practice, and that they, if they do get in trouble, that they can easily point their finger at everybody else rather than look in the mirror and accept the fact that they brought this upon themselves. And if this is a very uh, topic that we can talk many hours about and have devoted Many hours of, you know, we've been on the air now over 70 hours, all total, right, with all our episodes. We add about one hour each for a little over a year. And we talk about this kind of thing almost, almost every episode, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just one of those things that's creeping up on us. And we may sound like the keyboard commandos. Oh, the research says, the research says. But the reality is it's not just the research. It's our cold, hard fact. When we're out teaching students... We see this behavior. You know, I, we see it every single day where we see, I see people come to me for Archie, for example, and they're there because parent says so. 
but they know everything about archery, and I can't teach them anything. So what happens? That $500 bow that mom just bought you, you're smashing arrows, you're losing arrows, and you're not listening. And they go away, and their parents spent the money on them, and the, the kids knew everything before they came, and they learned nothing. And they ended up not improving who they are. So it's very important to understand that although we have an interest in something, there's always something to be learned. You know, even as outdoor educators ourselves and instructors and all that stuff, AD Venture and I are always in training. We are always learning. We're always going to social events. We're taking classes. We're attending lectures. It's a lifelong process of learning because what I know today, two years from now, may be found out that there's a better way. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really, I'm sure, AD, you can speak to this a little bit about that. Um, not only do we live an adventure junkie type lifestyle, but we also at the same time live a lifestyle that we are permanent students. Actually, the Wolfman brings up a really great point. Not only is society today not putting the proper emphasis on nature exposure, it's also not putting enough emphasis on learning. And you see that with for example, this youngster that the Wolfman had to deal with, that he thought that he knew it all. Now, we have to be honest, a lot of young people are like that, and, and it is part of that uh, growing up and transition period and so forth. However, I remember things being a lot different back in my day, where if I was provided with a learning opportunity, I kept my mouth shut, I showed respect to my elder, and I learned as much as possible, because I never knew if those skills that I was learning I could benefit from in the future. And that, thankfully, has helped me continue with my love of learning after my youth. And as the Wolfman said, we're constantly keeping our skills updated, constantly trying to learn new skills and new ways to instruct other people, keep them safe, and have them enjoy something that really should be an integral part of their lives. And I think that's sort of why we do this podcast, right? We love, we love all of you guys. We love our listeners. I want to bring you the best of the best of the outdoor education world. And on that note, I would like to thank all of our amazing listeners for tuning in to the Barefoot Bushcraft radio show. Please visit us online at barefootbushcraft.com. I'm the Wolfman, the host of the show, and of course our producer, A.D. Venture. Thanks for joining us, and of course, please consider subscribing.